when we throw things away, there is no away. Like these things go somewhere and that somewhere is often seized land and deforested land and land that has been built in a, as a crater. Hi, my name is Celine Saman and I'm the co-founder of The Slow Factory, an organization that works at the intersection of climate justice and human rights. The Slow Factory started 11 years ago. We started working with open data, NASA satellite images of the Earth. And what we wanted to do is bring the data of the Earth transforming and changing closer to people so that they can see that we are part of this ecosystem. Climate justice is a human rights issue. Climate justice is a women's rights issue. Um, climate justice is about free Palestine. Climate justice is about Black Lives Matter. It's about, you know, black and brown and indigenous people are the leading voices of transformation for climate positive solutions and climate care uh, systems. We started exploring how can we build a system, a better system, a regenerative system, while also transforming the existing one. And so we work closely with culture, education, storytelling, making things more accessible, lowering the barrier to entry to science. I think for us at Slow Factory, we um, practice um, collective disillusionment, which means that we are not in, um, interested in maintaining the status quo of illusion. That means for us, objectivity is a form of illusion. Like there is no objectivity um, if you want to look at it. It's almost artificial to pretend to be objective. And so we um, just embrace the subjectivity, but provide it with a lot of context to support uh, a multi-perspective. When we're talking about climate justice, it's also about geopolitics. And right now we're really seeing what it looks like and how things that are happening in Palestine, Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo, they are interconnected because they are all about uh, climate change, actually. For example, in the context of the Congo, um, you know, talking about the genocide that is occurring there at the moment without mentioning that it is about resources and that it is about um, an international gain on these resources, resources that are used where? They're used in batteries for cars, for electric cars, they're used on our, in our phones. These are precious metals that are used in technology. And so being able to connect the dots between Google, Apple, Congo, the genocide, the nearby countries, American interests, corporate interests. It's not about activism. This is the journalism that is missing in mainstream media. What we are seeing here in Gaza, it's a war to access gas. Um, it's not even something that is so mysterious. It has been very much um, explicit in, 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 the, in the agenda of this genocide. Uh, there's also a war in south of Lebanon, similarly to access regions in the Mediterranean Sea that contains gas. The political leaders understand that we have to diversify from oil. And what they are suggesting is that we move into gas, which is as toxic as oil. It is also a finite resource. It is also a resource that emits a lot of carbon emissions and methane. Often people ask me, what can I do, you know? And I say, um, you can do the best that you can. Of course, it's a lifestyle, it's a culture. For us, sustainability is not something you buy or something you compost. It's really how you live your life, it's a culture. It can be in the ways in which you're organizing for your community. It can be in the ways in which you are, um, you know, uh, engaging in education, engaging in unlearning, unlearning systems of oppression. It can also be in the ways in which you are fabricating things or, or mending things or fixing things. You're engaged in a fixing culture. It's all about which culture you're part of or how many cultures you can be part of, but also it's about transforming the ways in which we relate to things so that we don't think of things as disposable. 
And so for me, the best way to explain it is, um, you know, taking people to the landfills as part of our program, landfills as museums. When we take people to the landfills, especially designers, we're able to see the um, cognitive shift that happens when people are walking and hiking on mountains and mountains of waste. And so how can we design better, you know? There's no waste in nature, as you know. And so how can we design a system that is inspired by nature, that is um, informed by nature, things that would go back to nature as food, not as poison. Regenerative systems are um, just like nature. These types of systems are in contrast with the current systems that we now have, which are linear, very much 2D sorts of systems. They begin from a point of extraction and end all the way in a point of um, discharge, uh, po pollution. Um, and, and throughout this linear system, there are various points of discharge. The regenerative systems that we are interested in building and that we have built are systems of care. They're systems of care for the environment. They're systems of care for the end life, the end of life of specific products or specific processes. Um, they're also very much inspired by a waste to resource model. The systems that we're presenting are much easier actually to imagine and much easier to implement because they are actually natural systems or nature-based solutions or biomimicry, which is basically learning from nature. They care about the environment, they care about the end of life, they care about people all around the system itself. It's basically a system that's built on the notion of radical generosity and reciprocity. If you're taking something, you have to give it back 10 times.